And ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Modern Man Podcast. Today we have a really interesting topic that we're going to be speaking about. We're going to be speaking about the mental health for a specific group of people, namely artists, musicians, creatives. I think something very interesting. And joining us today for this discussion is somebody that is inside the industry who can help us better understand it. Mr. Aiden K, welcome back. Hey, bro, let me just <laughs> move that up the way. <laughs> oh, I'm glad that we're doing another one at least. Bro. Yeah. Like yeah, since we shot the last one, eh? Actually, a little bit longer, I think. I think the last year it was like April, oh, March. Well, and the then we, we threatened to do it. And, yeah. Then, yeah. and then yeah. we're still going to do our Aliens and Discovery ones. Bro. Yeah, yeah, we will get there. We'll get there. <laughs> okay, dude, I'm just going to jump straight into it, bro. You have been a big advocate for mental health. I mean, I watched your documentary that you dropped during lockdown. Why is it such a big thing for you? I think it was just something that I I gravitated towards being in tune with how I feel, how I think. I was I was the kind of person that goes to like exclusive books and buys like five books. I never finished reading most of them, but like, <laughs> yo, I, I could I could probably kill someone if I had to drop the the, the amount of books yes, that I yeah. I have sitting in my storage unit in like a big crate. Right? It could literally <laughs> squash a human being. But I think it always just intrigued me as to how the brain works and when I started getting into this industry like I didn't actually realize how much of an impact it has on your mental health how mm. much you you constantly criticizing yourself you're, you're you're measuring yourself up against people that have a completely different story to you mm. who have had different circumstances and then in many ways I think I, I related to the Olympics with what I do I mean I don't at all think that I'm at any way as talented as the people who compete but <laughs> in a way you, you're always measuring yourself up to the best in the world and okay, yes, yeah. we, we're all fighting for the same space in a yes, way like we yes. we are trying to get heard we're trying to get seen we're trying to just compete like the, the the landscape for what we do is extremely competitive and I think when you're you're measuring yourself up against other people that voice inside your head starts to grow louder mm whether it's I'm not capable enough or yeah. this isn't good enough. And I think a lot of artists struggle with that. But I think more so people struggle with almost attaching themselves or kind of associating themselves to what they're doing, especially if you're somebody like myself who kind of struggles with imposter syndrome where okay. yes, you, yes. You, you, you might achieve something, but it's the, the, yeah, yeah. The, like, the gratification is short-lived. Mm. Um, it's a quick like, yeah, I did it. Yeah. And then you're like, ah. Oh, yeah. What's and the, and yeah. the, the biggest issue is, and this was something that I actually experienced as well when I was, mm. <laughs> when I got into TikTok in lockdown. Like yeah. I, I, for whatever reason, was like, yeah, I'm going to go full into, because we'll get into like what, yeah, what yeah, was yeah. happening at that time. But like, I just used to obsess with like, can I get the more, the most likes on a video or the most yes. views? And like, yes. when you start to strive for like an outcome like that, the when something falls way. flat yeah. or falls short, you, you beat yourself up about Big it. Time. And I think in a creative industry where there's no like there's no benchmark, there's no standard. Everyone, it's it's such a subjective field yes, that yes. you never really have control over what's going to happen with what you do. Yeah. The only thing you have control of is the, the the things that you can take action on. Yes, your input in a way. Exactly. Because I've seen it. I've I've heard it from a lot of creatives. They always say like the thing that they put out and they expect that to do the mm. best never does the best. And the thing that they just put out for putting out kind of blows up yeah. all the time. So yeah. it's, it's up and, and down the whole time. And what I what I experienced early on in my career was like being able to start making some momentum. And then, because I actually initially, when I got into the industry, I wasn't going by Aiden K. I was going by DJ AD. Okay. And I mean, it sounds as Boxberg as I was at the time. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it's the kind of person that like, you know, your friend is. DJ AD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like your mate. That's you, the DJ bro. that plays yeah, at yeah. like all the, all the family functions. But like, <laughs> I, I wanted to kind of set myself apart from who I had sort of become as just this like, bar dj and i yeah, wanted okay. to become an artist and when i rebranded as aiden k it almost lost all momentum in what i was doing and it no longer felt like i was moving forward it felt like i took like 10 steps back okay. and that that beat me up well that 
I beat myself yeah. up about that quite a lot. I was about to say, like you, you made that whole transition, yeah. and then it didn't. Because I don't, yeah, I, exactly. So, you must I, have been like, oh, fucked up. And it, exactly yeah. to your point of like how creatives tend to have an expectation of what was going to happen. Like I was making certain steps forward. I was playing at festivals. I was getting gigs at like nightclubs in and around Joburg, and I even played a couple of gigs in Durban. And like, I, I felt that once I made the step to become an artist. I would be able to kind of take it to the next level. And when I released the single that I did that year, and then the first sort of track is Aiden K, like nobody really paid attention yeah, to it. Yeah, no um, one realized exactly. who it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that time, I was also getting involved a lot more with working with Tomo TV and managing him and sort of doing a lot more stuff in the background. I was working for a record label. So I was doing a lot of stuff at the Soul back. Candy. At that time, it was yeah. Universal because I'd okay, moved from yes. Soul Candy to Universal in 2014 or end of 2014. Mm. And... So like I, I was in this position where I was working in the industry, feeling like I was making an impact, but I was actually just sort of serving other people's needs and goals. I was working more as a behind the scenes role and then I had no time for myself as an artist. So I kind of neglected that. And what that led to was like, I would see these people that I was working with achieving things or getting recognition for what they were doing, but I was the one that actually wanted to be doing it myself. Mm. Um, and when, when Tomo had the success that he did, I beat myself up more about it okay. because I was so close to somebody that I had been a part of his journey, but I was sort of getting left behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it looks like it's a one man show, but exactly, it's, it's not, exactly. Bro. So it's it's kind of at the end, of, like it is recognition, but it's also because you wanted to do it as your yes, own thing yes. at the same time. Yeah, yeah I get and you. To, to to kind of I think it's I, hard watching people win like it. Bro. It is, like, and I think yeah. it, it it's also hard when somebody can do what you want to do and sort of do that exclusively. When I at the time had to work sort of a day job, I was yes. handling his bookings and I was trying to make music. Mm. And you're watching someone else live your dream. Exactly. In a way, bro. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's never an easy thing. <laughs> yeah. Like fuck. And that 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 led me to 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 really sort of tailspin into a very depressive episode where like I went to I went to a psychiatrist. I was prescribed antidepressants, and I took them, and it felt like I I sort of regained some sense of confidence, and I started to take action and make music, and but it then sort of numbed me, and mm. I felt like what it was doing kind of only served a certain type of person. Yeah. And this is something that, I, that I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get into as well. Like as a creative, it felt like I was dulling myself to an Down. extent okay. to kind of manage the, the negative thoughts and emotions that come, come with what we do. Like I felt like I was tuning out the good as well. Like I just was like, completely yes, yes. numb. So you kind of balance that, like balances yeah. you in a way. So yeah. like it's that if you, you don't have those those huge highs and, and those lows. lows yes, but yeah. I kind of felt like I was stable and my just, my, my it's stagnant yeah. In a way, yeah. Like yeah. I was the kind of person that when I was growing up, like I was the, the shy kid that didn't want to ask the waiter for a drink at the the mm, restaurant. Mm. I'd ask my parents to do it. So to come into an industry where you have to kind of be this outgoing person having been i guess allowed to have somebody else talk for me or like those kinds of things as a kid like i didn't have the people skills either yes, so it was yeah. a very stressful period to yeah. kind of try and find myself and what was going on and then i didn't know if music was something i wanted to do i like then started looking into doing graphic design and like music kind of took a a, a break, a break. A yeah and then and then i, I guess i i I then I then went to therapy and kind of moved. Away. I just stopped taking the antibiotics, which is a bad idea if you do ever go on them because you shouldn't just sort of stop. But I was like, "Fuck this! I yeah. can't. Yeah, I because can't it, actually." You kind of become dependent on it. Right? Yeah, but yeah. It, it was it wasn't making me feel like myself. I was just like I didn't feel. You as became like a zombie in a way. Exactly. Right? I think that's like sorry, just in a little quick. Uh Luke, conspiracy yeah. theory <laughs> yeah. I think that's the majority of the time why they always prescribe these things because I think it just yeah. dulls down people's like well it's, it's the closest we have to a one size fits all solution to this yes this, pills yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, and <laughs> we, we, we digress <laughs> and uh I, I then sort of started taking a different approach, which, which was more cognitive behavioral therapy, which helped me figure out what the problem was, which was uncovering this feeling of uh I guess anxiety and frustration that I wasn't making the steps forward that I needed to. And once I started to take action, I sort of saw the results. Mm. And then we hit 2020 and like everything just changed entirely. Oh, like, fuck, so this is still back then? This is, yeah, this was like oh, 2016, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2017. Mm. And in 2019, I started to sort of make 
more music and people started to recognize me for the songs that I was making and then I was yeah, getting yeah. more gigs. And we went into lockdown and everything that we knew as creatives and artists and performers completely changed. Mm. And that's kind of what led me to do the documentary yes, yeah. that I did during that time. Called, and what sort of spurred that on was also going back to the Olympics was actually a, a documentary that Michael Phelps did called The Weight of Gold, I think it was called. Oh, shit, okay. And his his whole approach to it was how strenuous the the the, limp, the the life of an Olympian is and how just mental health is something that's neglected in athletes. And I think it's equally so in in yeah. the arts and what we yeah, do. Yeah. Um, and I remember I was I remember the moment that I thought of doing that documentary. I was standing in the gym in January 2021, just after we went back into lockdown before New Year's. Mm. And I was just thinking to myself, like, what are all these people that I once saw, like, every week? And what are they all doing with their lives? Like, how, there was such how a is everyone surviving? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also just, like, how are people coping with this? Because yes, I was yeah. struggling, but I felt at the time that there was something wrong with me. Like, why am I the one that's struggling with yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Or, like, I was beating myself up because I was like, I'm not doing anything about it like i'm sitting here like at that time if if you relied exclusively on like performance income or, th or things like that and you didn't have like music coming in or music royalties coming in like extremely you you yeah, yeah, yeah. extremely compromised and yeah, i just you were like a performing dj you yeah kind of fucked. Yeah. yeah whether it was somebody that made like was a, a club dj or, or like a corporate dj and not only the the, the performers themselves but the entire industry Everybody, and, and yeah. the landscape and what I, at the time, what just wanted to do was just speak to some friends about it. I just really wanted to get their their thoughts on it. And that kind of snowballed into something that was a bit bigger than what I realized, but still served the same purpose. Because it wasn't, it wasn't like I was making something to kind of talk about myself or making something to, to make money. It was literally, I just want to tell the story. Because at the time, we were the, the, the entertainment industry was very much portrayed as like a... Uh, a nuisance and, and and kind of a threat to people to like public health mm -hmm. and nobody yeah, was speaking at that point everybody was just like oh yeah, yeah and stay at home fucking exactly do this and that exactly and, it's scary and to look back at what we had no like. control yeah. over how much yeah. we could do like we weren't allowed to work mm -hmm. and to have people's livelihood taken away is one thing but what i found in that time was what was really difficult for people was to have their sense of purpose taken away like if you if if you take somebody's livelihood or income away, it's not as mentally traumatizing as somebody that you take away their income and their livelihood and their ability to feed their families, but also how they identify, how they how they've come to to portray themselves in the yes, world, yes, how yes. their passion, their their um, it's an everyday thing that it you is. just yeah, um, and just that like, no. yeah. and that that was really the, the I guess the the core message of that documentary was like how much of an impact purpose and fulfillment and having a sense of purpose to wake up in the yes, morning. Yes, Cause yes. if you, if you just know today, you're not going to be able to do anything and you Tomorrow's have no control. Same, of it. Yeah. You, you just, you end up in a very dark place. Yeah. It's a and big spiral, I think yeah. because when it goes consistently, consistently, I mean like the industry was fucked for like a very long time. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember we didn't, I didn't make any income from gigs for 18 months. Fuck no. And eventually I, got a, I, I had to get a full-time job to sort of supplement the income. And then when things started to open up, I could sort of leave that behind and then sort of mm. focus on, on, on gigs and events again. But I think what sort of changed for me in my career was the ability to tell that story and I guess have people open up to who I was and what I was doing yes. because before it was kind of as I said I was kind of seen as somebody that worked behind the scenes but everyone sort of knew me they knew of me they knew what I did but yeah. they didn't they, know you though I wasn't I didn't get the rec any recognition and mm. what happened subsequently to that was I guess having that recognition and not knowing what to do with it because then I started to do more events I started to get more gigs I started to get the gigs I really wanted to play and then it's a it's a different beast entirely when you start to get recognition. What you want. But you don't necessarily feel like you deserve it. And mm. all those wins, all the achievements that you, you kind of are able to to accomplish have very little meaning. Yeah, it feels insignificant. Mm. It feels like you did something, you know, like other people would look at it and be like, wow, that's fucking crazy. Exactly. That's really, really good. You know, you must have worked hard or whatever. Even if people say you're lucky, I don't give a shit. But, yeah, when you kind of look at it yourself, you're like, yeah, cool, okay, uh. And that's that's that's. That I remember at the time seeing a, 
like you know like those inspirational quotes that pop up every now and again and it was uh, it was basically saying like every when everyone's telling you that you're doing well but deep down this is how you feel and it was like this, mm. this it's just like this like random dude just staring like empty yeah. and that's that's kind of how it felt at the time yes. it was like people would would sort of acknowledge what i'd been doing or like that oh it's so nice to see like you getting out there but when I felt like that was what was going to define my happiness or my purpose, like it was all based off of just recognition and that in yeah, itself. Yeah, I think itself. it's outside validation as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I think a lot of artists tend to base their uh, their self worth on like how much validation they get. Yeah, because I, the idea is like that. I mean, if you just think about the business model itself of being a creative or an artist or musician. People base their success on the numbers because that's kind of you're putting out content, music, whatever to get numbers, yeah. basically. But I think that's that's the catch twenty two about it. Like you want it, yeah, but you shouldn't need it. But yeah. if it's your full time job, but you, then you need it, in, so it's like you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place exactly. the whole time. Exactly. So then, what do you do? So as you said, you you feel like you have that imposter syndrome, something like that. What do you do to combat something like that well what i did i guess to make myself feel better about that was i started to drink more when i was out i i kind of used alcohol at the time to give myself the the personality that i i didn't have when i was sober oh, so like supplement you yeah, yeah. Kind of vibe, yeah and i, I mean I, I know a lot of of artists djs just people in the space especially that use some crutch or some ha something to help mm. alleviate some their bias, yeah, yeah some bias to just basically it, it helps you get through what you're you're expected to do mm. and i mean i was doing at in 2022 i played 146 gigs and fuck me of that 146 think, what's yeah. that that's like nearly one every three days bro yeah i mean yeah. there were there were, yeah. there were weeks there were weeks where i was playing seven or eight gigs and then there was on top of that. Well, part of that was like I was doing events because I'd started that yeah, just as we came out of lockdown. And there was a garden party yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And that, at that at that time, I I think in that year I did 40, 42 odd of those gigs with my own events. So like, there's a whole other level of work level, that goes yeah. into an event yeah, versus yeah, yeah. just a gig. And I started to experience burnout. But when I was at these gigs, obviously, when people start to have that uh, or give you that attention, you start to have to be a certain way you have yeah. to kind you become of, a character bro. yeah it's a public character it does yeah. become a yeah. public character it becomes a face that you mm. basically have to put on for the world yeah and for me as i said previously it was like i was never the kind of person that thrived on that i'm not mm. an extroverted person although i do enjoy being around people which is why That's what right. i do has always been I guess less intimidating than it is for some, yeah, yeah, but I'm not the kind of person that's like the life of the party that's gonna be able to just entertain vibe, yeah. me exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it becomes quite draining when you, w the way that I am as a as a as a person is like I'm I'm very much adamant on having things done a certain way, and with that a control for yeah. you, but that that that's a normal thing. But with that comes kind of person, comes yeah. a whole comes a lot of stress with how you have to now be responsible for a lot of that so yeah. and um what what i realized was like i i was relying on drinking to just sort of get me through the nights where i'd have to be out for like eight to 12 hours because yeah. i'd get to especially when i was doing events at the lotus where i started the garden party like mm -hmm. i would have to arrive there at like 10 a.m if we were starting in the afternoon and then i'd leave at like 2 a.m 3 a.m mm -hmm. because I'd have to be present the whole time because I was responsible for running everything, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. running the venue and running the event. And I just, I couldn't do it sober anymore. And... does it? Do you think it kind of got you out of your head, bro? Yeah, for sure. Because you were always like living yeah. there and you were thinking too much and your yes. brain was moving at like 120 kilometers. 100%. And then like, let's say the alcohol as that vice was just something that just kind of made you a bit more present yeah. in a way. Yeah. Well, it, 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 which is it, not a good thing it's nice to be more present but yeah. it just relaxed you a bit you kind of no, didn't did. have as much stress yeah. or and i think especially with yeah. how much was going on at that time like the ability to drown out those thoughts and that kind of anxiety yeah, yeah, was yeah. was the only way that i could sort of cope and like just keep trying to put all that i could into what i was doing and i think i was also as i said like i've always been my harshest critic so like when when it came to music i would just 
hold off on ever releasing anything because I had to have it a certain way with it events. Had to be perfect. Yeah, with yes. events, I used to just get irrationally upset with dumb shit. Like I would, mm. but then at the same time, like you, you are when when you're doing these things yourself. Mm. Like when things are wrong, there's nobody else to turn to. Like Dude, you, one hundred percent, you got to take the full responsibility mm. of everything. And you know, what, like as you're saying this, it's not the worst characteristics to have to want something to be done a certain yeah. way. It just means you give a fuck. You yeah. know what I mean? There's a lot of people that are just lazy with production of any sort of content parties or stuff like that where they just overlook the small things yeah. or you know they just don't care as mm -hmm. much as you do but at the same time they never will care yeah. because it's not theirs yeah. it's yours it's your name on the line your reputation people will remember you yeah. if it does go wrong yeah. you know what I mean so and I think that's something I've always struggled with is just trying to sort of let go of that that mm -hmm. part of me that's quite controlling and I think it, it, it just kind of led me to a point where like nothing really felt fulfilling anymore like mm. what i was doing what i was trying to achieve or what i was achieving like it no longer had that feeling of okay well this is something i've accomplished now this mm. is something that i'm actually like able to look at and say i've done this this is the work that i put in this is what it led to and then have any sense of connection to it yes and i think with with being out in in joburg especially like I started to get exposed to a lot more people around me taking drugs and it didn't feel as though it was something that I was ever a part of. Like, I mean, I was super fucking naive as to like what was going on. And oh, yeah. like I, which is a normal thing, bro. I'm not going to lie to you. Like I, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty street smart in general, mm. bro, but I was also naive when it comes to like, you don't actually realize how many people do drugs until you yeah. realize that they do yeah. fucking drugs. It's actually, it's, it's insane. It's, more people than not yeah and yeah. the thing is like being around being around the people in the industry like it's easy to hide it a lot of the time until it's not but you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily pick up on it you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell or like no people hide it well yeah bro. like yeah. I, I remember that the first time i ever noticed somebody was just out of it that i was working with at a it was a festival and like the guy came to talk to to myself and tim and like i could see it in his eyes i was like this isn't alcohol. This like, isn't normal. Yeah, yeah this yeah, is a yeah. normal behavior. But like, I think when when you start to sort of get some some level of fame or, or, or notoriety popularity, or, or popularity, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever you want to call it, you tend to attract a certain type of person around you that, that mm. wants to be associated with you. They want to sort of be recognized by you. Mm. And I think in Joburg in particular, like when you start hanging around certain areas, you tend to... I guess see a different side of it that you don't see, especially like myself growing up okay. in the East Rand. Like, yeah, you saw people in their forties drunk on brandy and coke, well, fighting outside bro. cool runnings, but you never, you never really like associate going out with more than alcohol. Yeah, it, alcohol was it's the stable, most common thing, and, and you yeah. don't really look past it in yeah. a way. Yeah, and like I think what what happened to myself was like I. I allowed taking drugs to become the crutch that alcohol no longer served me. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, it, it's not to say that it's a gateway to it, but it was what that numbed Dude, was the thing that numbed yeah. was what doing cocaine numbed was. Yeah. It was the thing that quietened the voice in my head that mm. stopped me from self criticizing myself it gave me a level of confidence that i didn't and have otherwise like Superman, bro, yeah. and time went by quickly i could drink more if i wanted to because i never had hangover yes yeah. about the only thing i missed was <laughs> fucking <laughs> you know, now if i drink like one beer i'm drunk and i wake up with a hangover so you stop drinking now completely not uh, like the thing You're is like a lot of people when they when they they go through trying to get sober is that you you kind of you, you 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 as we were talking about uh, mm. uh, antidepressants, like the the way of dealing or treating addiction is you basically try and approach it in a one size fits all way. They, they've written the 12 steps, it's well published, it's well researched and it works for people. But for me, I think given, like I remember at, uh, coming into the industry and like the first time I ever met somebody that was an addict, he was an alcoholic, but he used to DJ and he couldn't anymore because he couldn't be out. And that was something that I was always kind of concerned for myself about. Yes, yeah. When I realized like I was depending on these things to be this person. I was like, yeah. now if I give this up, do I have to stop doing stop. what I do? 
Yeah. See, I, 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 bl- I understand what you're saying there completely, bro, because I was even speaking to my friend the other day because we, we did now, uh, well, I did three weeks just sober, bro. Like, mm-hmm. no, no alcohol, no weed. It sounded like a very short time, but for me, it was, it it was long. long, bro. Yeah. Like, but I, w- I did it for the fact to see if, was I needed, or like, that was I yes. dependent on yes. it? And I realized I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So then I had one week of drinking, and from today, I'm going back onto the sober train. But I'm exactly like you. I don't want to like how do I say forfeited completely yeah. you know be like no I'm not going out I'm not having one drink because I'm scared of what might yeah. happen afterwards I don't want to like let that have control over me yeah. instead of me having control over it yeah. and I mean that was the thing like I I'd attended a couple of meetings because it got to the point where like it was hard like it was hard to I mean as they say it in the kind of the terms like it's, it was hard to put 24 hours together where I was sober at the beginning of this year it was hard for me to stay sober for a day which sounds ridiculous but at the time like with the thing is it, with addiction it can apply to something that's hard like cocaine heroin whatever mm. not that i ever did heroin yeah let me just state that but <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if i did i probably wouldn't be sitting here but my yeah. point being is that like whether it's vaping or alcohol like some people can't make that through make through those 24 hours mm. and it that was a, anything it can right? be anything it can yeah. be vaping like I, I at this point can't make it through 24 hours without vaping but mm. It, I realized that I didn't really have a predilection to addiction. More so it was like what I'd been struggling with was this feeling inside of me. What was this, what was this anxiety that led me down this path? Mm. And that was kind of the journey that I went on to try and figure all of that out. Mm. And for me, abstinence wasn't the was solution. It, yeah, it wasn't it was like, answer, abstain- yeah. like It's almost like a scorched, or scorched earth. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I still smoke weed. I still drink. But mm. for me, it was realizing that this vice that I'd come to rely on to take away those negative thoughts, those feelings of mm. inferiority, those feelings. Because like, for me, it was, a big, it was a big change to go from kind of no one r- really giving me any recognition too to quick. now having what I'd... S- too quick, like, like, like what instant, I, yeah, yeah, what I strove for, mm. but not knowing how to connect to it. Or not like knowing what it actually... Accepted in a yeah. way. Yeah, yeah like and I mean, embrace I, it in a way. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think for so long that I'd when it took me like eight years to kind of get the recognition that I was looking for to now have people say like, oh, okay, you're doing really well. I believed I was doing well back, at, then. back then and I never really got it. So like now what's changed? Like it was a hard thing to try and what understand. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. And what I realized I was relying on this for was how do I be that, that public person? That character. But at the time I kind of felt as though that was actually working. Like the, the biggest lie that I've ever told myself was that it was okay to keep doing this. Like I never, I never in the beginning felt I had a problem. I never felt like there was an issue with what I was doing. I felt that it was actually helping me be better at what I was doing or be a better person for it. Yeah. Because it also, okay. it, it just like the way that your the chemicals in your brain can get manipulated by. Yeah, you, 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 you what's the name? You tell yourself a yeah, story. You, you, know, you spin the, yourself you, a story, bro. I could, yeah. like I, I always consider myself somebody that was kind of strong-willed or. or, or at least intelligent, but I, I proved that wrong a lot of times in the last year. Um, but I guess kind of coming to the realization that it was no longer sustainable, it was no longer at all a, a lifestyle. Or, going forward, yeah, yeah. They, they, it, it just financially, emotionally, health-wise. Yeah, like I was about I could, to say physically. It physically, it could, like, I mean, there was... Throw you down the gutter. I bro. think it was, it, it was around September last year. I, rem- I remember playing a gig and, like, one of the other DJs came up to me. He's like, bro, are you, look, are you okay? Like, you look sick. And, like, from that point, it was kind of... That was where, like, my mind started to shift as to... Okay, I can't... This is no longer something that I can keep doing this way. Like, yeah. I can't keep putting my body through this. I can't keep putting my family through this, my friends through it. Like I missed my best friend that I grew up with wedding last year because I just like mentally I couldn't I couldn't sure. stay sober and like I couldn't actually bring myself to Yeah. To try and connect to that life as well. Because that was the other thing. Like I'd sort of walk down this path with certain people that they the old that. life that I had no longer Existed. was there for me, yeah, yeah, but yeah. no longer had the same appeal to me either because mm. I couldn't hide who I like what I was doing because mm. uh, that's a big thing that a lot of people will sort of notice when when this happens. It's like you start to uh, like retreat and you start to sort of isolate yourself from the people who before kind of knew you, your family, your friends. And I think I look, I look back on the time now and it's like, in a way, 
what could have helped me get through it was knowing that it wasn't the person that I was because I knew who I'd been for 29 years leading up to that point. Mm. But what I'd sort of gotten lost in was this lack of identity because I'd, I'd achieved what I'd sort of set out to, whether it yeah, was yeah, yeah. playing at Ultra for the first time or releasing music that got certain amount of streams or hit this chart, whatever it was. Like when I started to achieve those, like my ability to define a direction, like the compass that was pointing a certain way was gone. Because no, nothing had like, that. What, what do I do now? Exactly. Yeah. Nothing yeah. had that sense of fulfillment or just I had no connection to it. Yes. And As you say, you kind of lost purpose identity i lost identity yeah. i did yeah. because i was also at that time like i became more focused on being aiden k than mm. just being the person that i was sitting at home every day yes, yeah. um and it just took me a lot more time than i wanted it to to realize that like i really just needed to find my identity mm. and it was actually my dad that helped me get through that because he him and my mom got divorced when i was quite young and he actually he just he unfortunately lives in in Italy, so like going through all of this, I didn't really have a support support structure either. But he just said to me like he went through something similar or went through a similar like crisis of identity uh, around the time that my parents got divorced, and that that process of finding himself was how he moved forward from just mm -hmm. the, the 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 sort of the implications of losing that that, yeah, that yeah, identity yeah. that you go through, and trying to redefine who I was, like what I was about, what I wanted to do. Yeah, you like kind of create sense, a new person. Yeah, but yeah. in a sense, trying to do it also more, I guess, wholesomely. I was about to say, you know, do something that's good for you, yeah. not good for anybody else, not, as you say, the public character that you're putting yeah. on. It's now for you. And it's, it's, more, it's far more aligned now with who I am mm -hmm. as a person than what it was before because I was trying to, to sort of fit into what people's expectation was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to I try think, get trending, to yeah. try get this, try get that, yeah. Yeah, and I think in very much the same way as what the antidepressants did, like relying on cocaine to just sort of numb myself. Yeah. It was the way of, as I said, it was my way of dealing with anxiety that I was feeling and all these negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. But what I realized when I'd start playing certain gigs or like getting experience certain things like it numbed the the, the negative as much as it the did the high yeah. so i'd play a cool gig in front of two thousand people and feel nothing and it it took some time to kind of realize that like yes it was all my way of dealing with the shit that i was hiding away from or like what i was going through yeah. but it was making me miss out on, on memories life, on though. life yeah for sure and it was actually the, it was watching a, a, a bunch of videos that steve-o from Jack oh, Acid Major because he, oh, he was, he's sober now. Eh? He's sober yeah, now. Yeah, and yeah. watching like videos on YouTube on his YouTube channel about like how he turned his life around, like it started to make me kind of envy being clean. And that feeling for me was the driving sort of determinator of going like this isn't how life needs to be. I was about to say, so was that your turning point where you just yeah. kind of you, Well actually you realized, the turning point yeah. that I had was taking about ten grams of mushrooms and having a complete dissolution of reality. That was about <laughs> that was my new what year's did you experience, that was my bro? new year's. Really? Yeah, like I, I remember playing ten it, grams. Yeah, fucking hell. <laughs> I remember playing a truth on on New Year's, and I think mm. I, I got home at like eleven thirty a.m. on the first. first yes, yeah. yeah, I played like three sets for fucking I, don't, I can't even remember how long. I was playing for like six hours that night, and I got home and I, like I was just sitting there. I was like, fuck it, like this can't be the way I start this year. Yeah, and I was like, but I don't want to sit here now and think about that. Had really not slept, and I know I'm not going to sleep. So then I was just like, you "Fuck it, I'm going to do this." Yeah. And I sat alone, which is kind of how I've always wanted, like, taken mushrooms. And there was just this moment where, like, I kind of had this spiritual reawakening as well, where I realized that, like, the I'd been seeing the path that I needed to take, but I wasn't really taking any action. And the, the way of sort of getting to where I wanted to be, where I needed to be, was just living a more godly life living more in line with principles that i felt i wanted to be defined by and not just sort of because it the, as we're talking about like how your brain sort of convinces itself and yeah, sort of yeah. manipulates itself it's like i believe that that was the only reality i could live like that was that's that the only was person who i'm gonna be yeah. everyone knows me as this that is yeah that is who i am that's that's my what what's yeah. the identity yeah. yeah yeah but the thing is with it, i think with addiction is like it 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 can fool you quite quickly or mm. it tricks you into thinking that what you're doing is fine. And then everyone that I know that I've spoken to about this, everyone that I'm close to that is experiencing this or has, there's a flip at some point where, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sex, whether it's gambling, whether it's 
where the return on what you is no anymore. longer worth it yeah. anymore. And you wake up one day and it's like it, it, yeah. it becomes it, it's it it becomes ugly. It becomes the darkest period in your life that mm. you it's it's almost like the sun doesn't come out anymore. And sure. I think especially with 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 doing something like cocaine is that because it keeps you awake because it 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 just literally attacks your nervous system and just floods your brain like I would, there was days where i'd go like three days without sleeping and then your body crashes and it takes you 24 hours maybe of sleep to recover mm. if that if you and then you must also wake up with such like a depro vibe oh, you know entirely, like after, after alcohol you know the next day after yeah. you got the, the but that's i call it what the the, the booze blues well i mean that's i yeah. mean if you look at the, the, the tattoos that i have on my face yes, yeah. they say come down come, and oh, i got wow. it i got these in the midst of it of what i was going through to remind myself yeah. And I would beat myself up because I would remind myself, like when I'd look at my hands, I'd be like, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to start taking action and I didn't take any action. Mm. And it took a while to, like, it, it's like as retarded as getting like a Chinese tattoo on yourself that you don't know the meaning. Like to have a <laughs> tattooed on myself that like I don't actually live the ethos that I w was prepared to yes. put out publicly, then why why did I do it in the first place? Yeah. Um, but that was the thing, like trying to embrace that come down was the hardest part of it because you can't deal with the person that you've become when you have to be sober. And that was part of what was the challenge for me was like, how do I now try and rebuild this life that I'd neglected or rediscover who I am or try and find an identity in a time yeah, yeah, where like yeah. there doesn't feel like there's mm. that, that ability. So it's like rock bottom in a way. But yeah. You said you... But from well, the thing is, like, I, I know. Yeah. It's the only way is up from there, but you can do whatever yeah. you want. And I mean, I have, I have a friend who, who would quote that quite a lot last year. We basically like, they say you hit rock bottom, but they don't. What they don't tell you is there's ten floors below. below it, yeah. And I think that's kind of how how addiction is: is that you 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 kind of like you take it this trip down, and you don't realize how many times you're gonna fall it going down. Worse, yeah. yeah, and it can get worse, and it can get worse. And I mean, it, it, I don't, I don't claim to like know the, the solution or even know what helped me because I, I see people around me and I see friends of mine that I care for dearly going through it as well mm. and what's worked for me doesn't work for them no of course yeah. and I think what, what I've always kind of tried to advocate for was the ability for people to speak up about what they're going through what they're feeling the stories about yeah I mean yeah. The, the documentary that I did was very much about like people that, speaking yes. up about that and that was the whole reason that when we spoke about doing this podcast this is what yeah. I wanted to speak about because I think there's there's a dangerous possibility in the future that like I mean I see it now with kids that are just coming out of school going to club or even in school going to clubs and already being exposed to that I mean I like we both said like how old are you now? 27. Okay, so we kind of like grew up at the same yes, time. Like yeah. this, this wasn't the reality that we had. Where no. drugs yeah. were everywhere, and like, and it's not that. And like, so easily accessible, yeah. and there's new things this, yeah. new things that. And I mean, I'd be the worst candidate or advocate for like say no to drugs, kids. But <laughs> in in all honesty, it's like they they. I waited. Oh, I didn't wait, but like I I was only 29 when I kind of like started experimenting. So, yeah. And. I'd already, my brain it was fully developed for like who I was going to be as a person. Like yeah, you, you physiologically, yourself, I was yeah. an adult. Mm -hmm. But to have experimented or, or kind of get swapped, getting gotten swept up the way that I did at a younger age, it could have had far worse implications oh, on who I was, my mental yeah. health. And I think with what I have come to learn is just like being better at sort of documenting how you feel and, and actually speaking to people about it that doesn't have to be a psychologist it can just be people that you, yeah. you, you care about and care about you family yeah. member yeah yeah and i mean i've always i've also always tried to be an advocate like I, whenever i feel compelled to i'll talk about it on instagram or things like that like just share messages about how people should be more forthcoming or, or more they should feel more comfortable being yeah. forthcoming with how not, they feel yeah, not so but also not about it, yeah, yeah also not to kind of feel as though that's like how you need to define yourself like a lot mm. of people will be like they feel like their problems define them and yeah that that can also be quite dangerous and you also don't want to get into a a, a situation where like you're not taking positive action or just talking about it isn't just enough talk, either exactly like um i was watching that joe rogan podcast and the lady that he had the i don't know what her book was called whatever but she they did studies and 
one of the number one reasons for depression is talking about your problems constantly. Yeah. And like, yeah. if you're not changing it and you still got the same problem in a month, it, unless it's something you can't change, then, you know, it is what it is. But yeah. if you consistently sit and just talk about, you kind of make the problem bigger than what it is. Of course. You know and what I, I mean? Even though it's a big problem, unless you're doing the actions yeah. followed by the uh, talking, you kind of but fucking yourself. That was a position I found myself in. Mm. I think I, I made a joke last year, I still remember. It was like, cocaine makes everyone think they're Dr. Phil. Because literally, bro, like when you're around people that are doing it, everyone talks as if they know the solution to life. But the, 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 it's like this juxtaposition between like thinking you have all the answers and then you can see that nobody yeah. has the answers. No, 100%. And no, because you're not, you, you're incapable of taking those actions. Yes. And uh, <laughs> what, talking about Joe Rogan, like the, what really, I guess, was the most intimidating thing for me was mm -hmm. like, he was, they were talking about um, Stephen King. I think, yeah, they were talking about Stephen King. And like, mm -hmm. he was also heavily addicted to alcohol and cocaine. Mm -hmm. And he wrote The Shining on that. He wrote Cujo on that. Yeah. And now if you kind of look at, like they were talking about his online persona now, he's like, completely gone left-wing liberal like fully just quite like completely different from the person that everyone sort of knew him for yeah. from his books and they were talking about like how you, you you know like that kind of like fueled his creativity and his art and like at a stage i felt like you if i had to give that. this up what like and what then does your art become? yeah what is my art become who do i become as a person do i lose yeah. and then like that was what i kind of felt with the way that the the 12 steps approaches addiction yeah. as was like it 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 fits and it works for a lot of people, but I didn't feel like I was prepared to give up that part of me that drove me down to yes. this because that's where I kind of felt like a lot of my uh, a lot of my passion for what I did yes. came from as well. Yeah. Like the the, the yeah. sense of inferiority mm. drove me to take the the risks and the chances sure. that I did. But if you if you look at it throughout history, all the greatest artists were all fucked up right if you think about yeah, it I mean, the everyone, majority of them yeah. if you look at Vincent van Gogh or yeah. um, I don't know too much about Da Vinci to be very honest with you but I mean most book writers most musicians I mean you think of even actors you can yeah. think actors majority of them all suffer from depression yeah. which is uh, like you get your what your Kurt Cobain Heath Ledger all of these oaks that died and took their lives so early I mean even look at Robin Williams Robin Williams it's actually, is today's 10 years since he passed sure. away and you know, he's, he's genuinely one of the, the people that I used to think about the most going yeah. through it was like, it's something that nobody really understands, but there, there's definitely signs where it starts to get worse. Mm. The more you isolate, the more you cut the world off, the more you start to, to sort of kind of let your those negative feelings and emotions and yes. dark thoughts manifest, the more it can take and like I know I've seen I've witnessed it on myself, I've witnessed it with people around me. It's like the more you shut off the possibility for there being any kind of reconciliation salvation, or yeah. salvation, whether it's spiritual or whether mm. it's just seeking help outside of yourself, mm. like you you can shut yourself off to the world and to sit with your thoughts is probably Sometimes can be the most thing dangerous thing 100%. ever. Yeah. But now do you think sorry, I was actually thinking about this in the car ride over here. Do you think a lot of people who are creatives, artists, whatever they push themselves to, as you say, do drugs, alcohol, be sad, depressed, because they feel that their their work becomes better. I don't. I don't necessarily think that at all. I think there's some people. I think honestly, if you had to, let's say like influence. If if, if I had to, if I had to ma mm. make a bet on it, my biggest assumption would be that most artists end up in that situation for something a lot deeper than their art. Okay. The art is, because the thing is, the art that you're creating is the only outlet that a lot of people have to feel better about themselves or for to, to kind of just, it's almost as if I, I, I've, I've experienced it and I know a few people as was like, when you're creative, it's almost as if there's something that sits inside of you every day that you have to get out. If you're a writer, it's writing. If you're an art, like if you're making music or a musician, it's just, there's something that's within you that needs to come out. And then that energy has... I, like it, it's almost like there's a transference it's mm. from your body into the world mm. but sometimes that energy can manifest if you don't have an outlet for it it can manifest internally and it can start to turn into whether it's anger whether it's frustration whether it's depression mm. and i think a lot of artists struggle with that more so than okay. relying yeah. on the stuff I, I can guarantee you that you you'll come up with some shit that you'll never think of but it's to say that it's better. Like I know for a fact that a lot of the DJ sets that I played where I was out of it were far worse, but in my mind I felt like they were better. 
but I was in prison. I wasn't able to actually be in it and actually connect with what I was doing. Yeah. So I numb myself to think. And like some went well, whatever, but it, I know that I wasn't actually the best version of myself in those yeah. times. Um, and I don't rely on it. Like I know a lot of people will drink when they make music or smoke weed, but I don't, like for me, the biggest high that I get now is in a way just shutting off the world and sitting down and making music. I mean, that's how I, like when I was able to sort of find that escape, like I think we all, when, when, you, when you have this predilection to kind of like be controlled by your thoughts, like having an outlet or an escape is essential, whether it's yes. gaming, whether it's, as we've said, like there's other addiction, but Anything. like could be reading books, could be reading so books, yeah, could be Netflix, yeah. could be eating. Like yeah. we all kind of are in search of that that something that outlet or that 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 vice that's going to kind of help us feel better about ourselves or just forget about our problems. And for me, what I kind of found was like being able to just shut off the world and reconnect with something that I was passionate about when I started out down this road yeah. actually helped me to kind of find that stability and that ability to feel accomplished again. Because losing that sense of accomplishment and that like the the way that I was feeling at the time led me to feel as though I didn't have any value or self worth, yeah, and yeah. Th it's just weird because like people can say things to you and mean like the, the meaning yeah. just doesn't doesn't ever sink yeah. in. Doesn't even go in through one ear out the other. It just <laughs> stopped no, really. right over there. And just sort of rediscovering that was mm -hmm. kind of how I got to this point of like just making more music now than what I had yeah. before because it was my kind of cathartic experience of just mm. being able to let go of all the shit that floats around in your brain every day mm. i mean that's a lot of what, why a lot of people journals why people do go to therapy is like to get that that stuff that's floating around in your system out, out. it's almost like yeah. if you had to view it as like a, a toxin it's like mm. you have to flush it out in some way whatever your outlet so is going to sit there and poison yeah you. yeah and that, that that can be whatever uh whether it's people upset about their job, people upset yeah. about their family, people upset about what they do. It's like those negative, sitting in those negative thoughts mm. can can cripple you. Yeah. So for now, I want to I wanna ask you, to anybody who's watching this and they're going through something similar, it doesn't even have to be addiction, same addiction yeah. as what you, what, what kind of advice or, I wouldn't say steps because fuck, none of us are qualified enough to give proper steps no. to. But I mean, just personal opinions, kind of. What, what would you tell somebody in this kind of position right now that wants to be in a better position after this? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I've always avoided trying to give people advice on on something like this because, as I said, like whenever I've tried, like the the reality is that everyone's journey and struggles are different so and, different yeah. and whether it's it's trauma that leads people down this road or whether it's something that's kind of you just felt like that's been there with mm. you like i very much felt growing up that like i was always like an outsider or was like i never kind of fitted in yeah, yeah, yeah. and i think uh, finding that personality that i had when i was to using helped me to fit in mm. and to to kind of have at the time having had to think about giving that up was more intimidating but I think that's the only thing piece of advice I can speak yeah. on is like if that's the situation that you find yourself in where you kind of feel as though you can't cope without it, the reality is, is that you very much can. Yeah. And you can only cope with it mm. if you aren't using because I've seen it happen to too many people in the, in the sort of past few years where like they've either lost the battle, like I lost a friend, I think, sure, it was middle of July, I think it was like the 19th of July, possibly sometime around that day, I lost a friend to what I can only speculate was an overdose. Um, and like, it's, it's like sometimes you don't even see the signs in somebody that they can be at that point. And I think like I, I found myself at that point last year where like I was prepared to give up, like I didn't have anything to fight for anymore. But what I did, kind of uncover was that like the only way I found something to fight for was to try my hardest to actually find myself again mm -hmm. by giving up this thing that had sort of poisoned my life, poisoned my brain, had kind of dragged me down. And as I said, like the only way that you can get better is to actually try in some way to deal with that thing that's yeah. si that's Place weighing it on, you. on yeah. yeah. And that 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 doesn't mean that you you can do that overnight. It took me several months. It's taken mm. some people that I know years. And I mean, I think it's an ongoing fight. It, it is. doesn't even end. It is. It yeah. never ends. But I think for me, the 
understanding what monster I was actually fighting was actually the best way for me to be able to mm -hmm. take control of my life again. Was yeah. Because if I didn't understand what had sort of been fueling and what had led me there, I would have never been able to take action to kind of yeah. undo yeah. The, the shit that had caused you myself. You found the problem. Yeah, and I think, I mean, even, uh, even in doing so, like only being in a better state of mind and being having my mind clearer actually allowed me to do that. I couldn't, I was at the time, I was trying to figure out world problems, believe me. Like I was, I, I thought I had all the answers and I thought like I would be able to just uncover everyone's yeah, psychological yeah. issues because of that, I was very much of an empath and that kind yes. of was, that, that was amplified. Oh, I can you, imagine. Like I, I thought that I could heal everyone and fix everyone. I wanted to get into life coaching at a stage, but, I think it was only once I sort of let that brain fog fade that I actually realized what was going on and like what had fueled those thoughts and how did. And the thing is, like when people talk to you when you're using or like when you're 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 caught caught up in addiction like that, like words don't have meaning anymore. But it's it's almost like there's a you <coughs> you have like this this surface level conversation that feels deep, and that's. That's a weird thing to experience. It's like you, you can have a deep Dude, conversation, but exactly you don't feel you, I've never been what's able below. to put that into words. Yeah. <laughs> it's, almost like, it's almost like you, you, you're just not breaking that, yeah. that layer or that, that, that uh, yeah, penetrating The tube, surface, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which is what a meaningful conversation between people should be mm -hmm. if you're speaking about these things. But mm -hmm. speaking about them in the midst of it, you're, you're literally just kind of... It's almost, <laughs> it's, it's almost like you're just kind of getting through this like the coating like you're, you're never you. actually getting yeah. through to the the core of what's going on and the meaningful shit yeah and mm. the thing is like things can feel meaningful things can feel impactful and you can have these moving experiences but deep down the, like your, your ability to connect with them because your brain is so compromised your ability to have memories and to, to hold like that's the thing for me is like when when something happens it be, and it becomes a memory like your connection to that is incredibly diminished in those situations oh, okay, yeah, because yeah. those those sometimes you'll forget about like your your short-term long-term memories is fucked but you'll you'll remember something but you disassociate it from it entirely because in the yeah. moment it was made you weren't yourself yeah. in the moment you're trying to reflect on it you're not so you're trying to forget it yeah well you even yeah. if you want to remember it you just actually don't have the ability to, to connect to that yeah. again it's like it's almost like when you're going through your brain's hard drive you can't open the file it's just there yeah. like you, <laughs> it's just it's just like the file extension file is gone. Unsupported. like you know like, you know like if you, if you could see the preview of yeah, it yeah, but yeah. you can't actually open it up and see yeah, it. that's yeah, kind yeah. of the best way i can describe Fucking that hell. no that's scary bro yeah. dude i just want to thank you for telling your story here today bro when, when yeah. you told me i was also I couldn't believe it, bro. Like I was okay. I, we've only met a couple yeah. of times, bro. But yeah, to, for you to tell me that, as you say, you you don't know what people are going through. Mm. You you, it, it's hard. It's easy to miss the signs. So if there's anything, just people look look out for your friends, look out for your family. You know, everyone's got a, a struggle that they're fighting. Yeah, and I think um, now some more than more oh, one hundred percent. I think with just the way the world is, there's always so many yeah. problems, so much information to take in that you. It's a lot easier to get caught up in that shit. Yeah, um, I have one last question for you. Uh, it actually comes from the previous guest. He's asked me to start something here. Okay. He's asked a question, didn't know who it was for, but yeah. Um, if you had 24 hours left to live, what would you do? Sure. I'd probably spend it on the couch with my girlfriend and my dog. 100%. Nice. Watching Criminal Minds. Watching. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Lovely, lovely. Well, dude, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast Thanks for having and me telling me. your story. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys have any questions, comments, opinions about anything. Uh, Direct them to Manny, not to yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't reply. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, well, there was a stage I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, and that makes sense, bro. Yeah, that, that was why he couldn't get a hold of me last year. <laughs> try and phone, if you had to try and call me, bro, I wouldn't return wasn't my it? dad's phone calls. Really? Yeah. Shit. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're not like that anymore, bro. Yeah, you're but the one that ducked me this time. Uh, actually, yeah. yeah. It's my girlfriend. She, she's the one who keeps me busy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this episode. And we will see you guys on the next episode. Cool. We have incoming message. The Modern Man Podcast.